Our scripture reading today comes from Philippians chapter 1, and it's verses 3 through 11. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart, for all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the, that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, through the glory and praise of God. This is the word of God proclaimed aloud so the world may hear his good news. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I really like puzzles. You know, the kind of the puzzles that you, know, you, you buy from the box, 250 pieces, 500, 1,000 pieces, whatever it may be. I love getting to do puzzles because they're a challenge. But I almost never sit down to start a puzzle. And do you know why I rarely ever sit down and start to do a puzzle? Any ideas of why? Well, yes, I can't stop. I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people when I'm on a task, I can't just stop and leave it looking like this picture that's about to be up on the screen. I go to people's houses, I've been to people's houses sometimes, and they have a, a puzzle table where, because you can tell they love to do it, and their puzzle looks like this. And I, I am very jealous of those kind of people. If you're one of those half-puzzle doers and can walk away, I'm jealous of you. Because when I do it, I have to sit down and finish it. Because it bothers me to leave anything unfinished, whether it's a puzzle or you name it, or anything else. Now, at times you wouldn't know that when you go on my desk and there's five or six different piles of unfinished things. It bothers me when I see it. That's not a, it's, it's not, I'm not doing it just because, but it bothers me. What about you? Do you guys hate to leave things unfinished? Do you guys hate to leave things looking like that, whether it's a puzzle, something from work, something at home, something you were volunteering with? Does it bother you to have to get up and walk away from something that's not completely done? Because if you're like me, you really dislike that word, unfinished especially if it's about some project that you started, some project that somebody has asked you to do or something you've really wanted to do. Perhaps it's the puzzle. Perhaps it's like our house. It's the dishes in the sink that sit there for two or three days before I finally get to doing them and washing them and putting them in the dishwasher. Maybe it's cleaning laundry in the, or putting the clean laundry from the clean laundry that I've taken out of the dryer put into the basket but then it takes me two or three days to get and fold and put away. I walk by those kind of things and they bother me. Or maybe it's bigger. Maybe, maybe you're one of these people who likes to do home renovations on your own. And you're in the middle of something, but then you have to go to work. You have to do something. It's time to, you're just tired and you have to leave it half done. Or just maybe just a little bit from being finished. projects, and we have to leave projects that are half finished, it bothers us. But it's quite another thing to shift from those projects and, and things and to-do list that we leave unfinished to realizing just how unfinished we are. We are as individuals. How unfinished we are in the eyes of faith and, and in our walks with God, and how unfinished our churches are. Maybe not our church buildings, but how unfinished we, as the church, you and me, together, how unfinished we are. And on that note, in this book, in, in this 
book, and it's not a book. I always call it a book of Philippians. I call it a book of, you know, the Second Corinthians, First Corinthians. They're not books. What they are is they're letters. And most of them are replies back that Paul is replying back to something that he has received, whether it's a letter he's received or a messenger that has come to him. But in this letter to the church, to Aaron Philippi, it's a very joy-filled letter. It's the most joyous letter that we have of Paul, which is ironic. Because at this point in time, when Paul was responding to this, Paul was sitting in a prison cell. And prisons in Jesus' day were not like prisons now. Prisons now are not very nice, but, but they're, you're required, I mean, the state requires us to at least treat people humanely, and, op, and they give them three meals a day, and shower, access to showers, and all those kind of things. And in Paul's day, there wasn't, at least in the Roman Empire, prisons weren't a place set aside. Prisons were usually, when you, went, when you were in prison, you usually were held in somebody's home. And you were usually chained to the wall in some room far away. There were no requirements for meals to be given, no requirement for access to a restroom or a clean room at that, for that matter. So it's really odd that Paul writes this very joy-filled letter to a church that he deeply loved in the midst of something you and I have probably never experienced, not even come close. The closest thing that anybody could experience to a prison in Paul's kind of day would be maybe being a POW. That would be about the closest experience that anybody might have. And this letter, it's, it's also strange because it stands in contrast to some of, other, some of Paul's other letters. When we read in First and Second Corinthians, Paul's not nearly as joyous. Paul is constantly going on and correcting the Corinthian church for things that they're not doing well, things that they are messing up on. Then you get to this letter to the church in Galatia, Galatians. We, we have really mellowed out some of Paul's language. We translate it from the Greek that he wrote it into English. But if you were to read it in the Greek and the language, what he's basically saying to the Galatians when in the opening of his letter is, you stupid people, what are you doing? I have taught you better than this. But then we come to a completely different tone in the letter of, to the Philippians. And Paul's letters, they also follow a certain form. There's a certain structure to them. The first two or three verses are usually a greeting where he lists a bunch of people that he's writing to, to the church whom I dearly love, this, this, and that, to somebody's name, if there's a particular person. And then the next set of scriptures, what we read today, is called the salutation. And then there's the body, and then there's a closing. Those, that is the structure of Paul's letters. And with a salutation, we get this beautiful, joy-filled words of grace and love to this church. Because Paul had a strong, caring relationship with them. He had planted that church in Philippi. And the church there in Philippi, although it's quite small, had funded a lot of his missionary trips throughout different parts of Greece. They had, that church had helped him plant other churches around. And while Paul was joyous, and his words to this church are filled with joy and happiness, the Philippians who received this letter were not nearly filled with that same level of joy and hope because they were worried and scared about their future. They were worried and scared what their future without Paul might look like. Because they were expecting him to come back and continue a lot of the work that he had already started. And they were concerned about Paul himself for his safety. Because in order to be fed in a prison cell back then, somebody from the outside had to bring you food. If you ended up starving to death while you were in prison, the authorities did not care. All that mattered to them was that you didn't escape. 
You either died or you stood trial. That's what mattered. Well, Paul had helped this church there in Philippi. When he started, he had helped this church become really become really successful in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel. And, and Philippi was not an easy place to do Christian ministry. The city was a very religious city. But it was not religious towards in the ways of Judaism or Christianity. Philippi was a city where people from all over the Roman Empire would come and retire. Roman soldiers would often retire there. Because what they would do, and they didn't have retirement, like pension retirements like we do today for the military. What the Roman government would do for their soldiers, they would give them a plot of land. And a lot of the land they would give would be in this area of Philippi. So it was filled with Roman soldiers, people who were very dedicated to the Roman government and the Roman religious system. There were all kinds of cultic religious buildings, pagan places of worship. It was not an easy city to plant a church and to grow a faith that is very different from all of the religious beliefs around it. But thanks to Paul's leadership and his encouragement, they really were a church alive, a church that was alive with Jesus Christ, a church that was booming and growing and expanding. And when Paul left to continue on his missionary journeys, again, he promised that he would come back to finish those things he started. But now with him sitting in the prison cell, they knew that that was unlikely to happen. The Philippian church were concerned. They were concerned whether or not they had what it took to finish what Paul had started. They were concerned that all of the initiative and, and momentum would just fade away if Paul didn't return. They were scared that they would remain unfinished. And how easy is it for you and I to fall into that same kind of worry? How easy is it for us to get caught up in to-do lists and things that we, that we want to do, that we feel we need to do, that people tell us we have to do, and then get overwhelmed or not be able to see how to move forward? Because we do not like to leave things unfinished. The vast majority of people don't. It makes us feel like failures. When there's something that we can't complete, it makes us feel like we're failures because we're told that you know, what our value is based on what we do and what we accomplish. And when we can't finish what we've set out to accomplish, it makes us feel like failures. And when we do that as a community, not just ourselves, it makes us feel like we're part of a community that's not alive, a part of a church community that is not transforming its neighborhood. I'm going to ask this question. What if God wants us to accept that we're unfinished? What if God wants us to accept the fact that you and I and this church and his church not just St. Paul's United Methodist Church, and not just the United Methodist Church, but His holy united church are unfinished. And that is on purpose. And what if God wants us to accept that so that He can be the one who finishes us? So the Philippian church feared that the work that God had started in them would remain unfinished if Paul didn't return. They were so focused on one person that they missed the bigger picture of, of who was empowering that person to help them in the first place. That's Jesus Christ. But it's to that fear that Paul wrote these words, and we're going to show up on the screen verses 3 through 6. And Paul says, I thank God every moment or every remembrance of you. Always in every one of my prayers for all of you praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. 
See, Paul didn't see himself as the leader of that church. He saw himself as a partner, somebody who was coming to walk alongside them. And what they had accomplished was not just because of Paul or just because of some individual there, but because of what Jesus Christ had worked through them. And Paul continues with this, I am confident of this. The one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Church, we are unfinished. We're unfinished so that we cannot take pride in ourselves for all that we accomplish in faith. We're unfinished in faith so that we have to rely on God and rely on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to take us step by step. We are unfinished as a church so that it's not just about one person. Or it's not just about a small group of people. We're unfinished so that our focus stays on Jesus Christ. Our focus stays on the mission. Our focus stays on the purpose of helping one another grow in faith and sharing that love and faith that we have experienced with those around us. I have heard a number of people come and say to me, I thought you would be the one to bring us back. I thought you would be the one to help us grow. I thought you would be the one, and now we just don't know. Church, if any of you have felt that way, that's the wrong focus. It's not about me at all. It's about you. Working together with whoever is in this position, walking alongside each other, not fighting against one another, but working to grow in faith together. Not trying to pull each other apart and tear each other down. But working together to grow. And the reason oftentimes we end up tearing each other apart or pulling each other down is because we're scared. We're scared of what the future might hold. Instead of focusing on Jesus Christ, we focus on all the things that separate us. Church, if there's anybody here who has bad feelings against another person, it's time for you to drop those. And it's time to focus on Christ. It's time to admit you are as unfinished as that person or group or whoever it may be that you don't care for. And focus on Jesus Christ. Paul had problems with that in other churches, not so much in Philippi. But Paul acknowledged that he had left that church unfinished, that he had left that church in a state where it had to rely on the hope of Jesus Christ and the grace given through the Holy Spirit in order for it to continue to go as it was. And he continually throughout the letter to this church, this scared church, this church that is worried about its future, he continues to always point them to the one who will finish the good work that he started, and that is Jesus Christ. You and I are unfinished as individuals who can only be completed by Jesus Christ. And as a church, and here I'm talking to you, St. Paul, as a church, you are unfinished. And that is a good place to be. It's a good place to acknowledge to be. Because when we admit we're unfinished, that means we see that we have room to grow. And we know that we have to rely on God to complete it. It is not about who stands up here and preaches. It's not about who stands up here and sings. It's not about anyone up here or anybody that sits in that office. It is about you, the church, who you trust, and how you live that trust out on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, admitting that we're unfinished doesn't mean that we don't have some kind of responsibility to respond to God. As we do, we have the responsibility to work alongside God, to work alongside one another, and to work alongside God. And Paul addresses this in verses 9 through 11, which is going to be up on the screen. And he says this, he says, And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight. Knowledge and insight given to us by the Holy Spirit, so that that love and that knowledge, that knowledge and insight that we have flows out of us. 
flows out of, one, out of us so that we experience it together as a church and so that those who are outside of this church, those who have not committed to following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior can experience it as well. To help you to determine what really matters. So that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and the praises of God. And that last line right there is the most important part of this section of Paul's letter, that salutation. That it comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. That is why we do what we do. That is why we gather for worship. That's why we gather to serve. That's why we sing. It's why we listen to Scripture and read it and study among one another. It's for the glory and the praise of Jesus Christ and God. It is not about what position we hold in a church, how much power we may have in it. It's not about being able to force people from another church or within our denomination to do our bidding and our will and make them conform to us. We do what we do humbly with the humility that we know that our goal is to give glory and praise to God. Churches will grow. Churches will boom. When that becomes our focus. When all the political stuff and warring and battles that we do, when we throw those aside and focus on giving God the glory and worshiping and praising Him, and opening ourselves up and realizing that we are not always right, we are unfinished, and we ourselves have room to grow, both individually, as an individual church, and as a denomination. The Philippian church was scared. They had been doing great work, and they had continued to do great, great work after Paul was gone, but they were scared. And they started to clam up, and they started to look only at the inside. They started to argue amongst one another. And if you want to see what Paul's response to that was, go read Philippians chapter 2. But to be a church alive... And to be the church alive, it means that we must accept we're unfinished and that we cannot finish ourselves and that we must depend and trust in God to finish us, that we must be open to that. And we must have the humility of knowing and accepting that we need that person sitting on our left, right, across the way, whoever it may be. Maybe it's the person you're trying to sit far away from. We need one another. And we must be willing to leave ourselves unfinished and let God come in and finish us and finish our churches. And as we do that, as we truly let God be that, as we truly let God be the one who empowers us, as we stop worrying about stupid fights, focusing on glorifying and honoring and worshiping God, we, our lives, our church will be increased by our love and our knowledge. God will give us the discernment, the sincere discernment we need to know where he is calling us forward. And he will fill us with those fruits of righteousness that Paul is talking about. Here's the thing, when we don't let God come in and complete us, when we don't do that, we will find other things. We will chase after other things that we think will complete us. And church, our denomination is in that situation right now. We're about to split because we're fighting over politics and power instead of focusing on Jesus Christ. And there is not a side that is not guilty. That does not need to happen at the local church. There's a lady who went to a grocery store to buy some fruit juice, 
And she found one that looked like this picture that's about to be up on the screen. I've kind of blacked out the uh, name of it for copyright and reasons and all that kind of stuff. But perhaps you've seen a bottle like this. And on the label, it said it was pomeg blueberry pomegranate flavored. It was 100% juice. It was all natural. And then she turned over the back to look at the ingredients, because you know that on everything that is sold, or any kind of consumable food, the FDA requires that there the manufacturers to put a list of ingredients in, and the list of ingredients goes, from, goes in order of the percentage of what ingredient is in there the most. So the most, whatever it is that has the highest percentage, is first, and then it goes down from there. And she looked at that ingredient list, and first she saw filtered water, which made sense. Most everything is made of water, especially things that we consume to drink. Then the next thing was pear juice concentrate. Then apple juice concentrate. Then grape juice concentrate. And she asked herself, where is the blueberry? Where is the pomegranate? And she finally found that they were the fifth and the seventh ingredients. And then right after that, there was some mysterious, unspecified natural flavors. In other words, whatever that was was too small to necessitate being able to, or to having to spell out each and every one. So according to this list, the juice she picked up had just enough blueberry and just enough pomegranate to give it its flavor and its color. And in the bottom corner of the label, in very and really small and really easy to miss type, were the telltale words that said, flavored juice blend with natural ingredients. This enticing picture, it had enticing pictures on it, the, and it's got clever labeling. They were, de, they were decoys used in order to, to sell this really diluted, barely able to call itself blueberry and pomegranate product. At best, it was flavored. It had been convincingly disguised to look like something it wasn't and to convince people of something it wasn't. So after reading it, she put it back on the shelf. And then she left the store empty-handed and was wondering, what, what if I had a list of ingredients printed on me? Not what we're actually made of, but those things that were most important to us, those things we base our lives on, those things that we make our choices based on. What if that list of ingredients was printed on me? She asked herself, would Jesus be the made ingredient? Would Jesus be the one that is top as it being the most important, the thing that actually fo my focus is on when going to make decisions? Or would it be something else? Would it be farther down the list? She asked herself, would my label accurately represent my contents? Or would what people see accurately represent those ingredients? Or would I falsely be projecting a misleading outward appearance that was cleverly masked some diluted ingredient? She said, my packaging may be convincing, and I may look and sound like the real thing, but if someone came to me looking for Jesus beneath the Christian label, would they find something else? Would they find something Jesus-flavored, but not Jesus-filled? And church, that's questions we need to ask ourselves individually and as a church. If we want to be a church alive, if we want to be that church that trusts in God, we have to ask ourselves, is that top ingredient Jesus Christ? Is our focus and purpose for being here on a Sunday morning to worship and glorify and honor Him? Or is it something else? Are the ways that we live at each and every day, the ways that we interact with one another, are they focused on Jesus Christ? Or are they focused on the desire to consolidate power? Or money? Or worse? The church alive and the Christian alive are Jesus-filled. 
with him being the top ingredient. But church, in order for us to be Jesus-filled, we have to trust him. We have to admit our unfinishedness and brokenness and trust him to come and finish us. Trust him to come and finish the promise he gave us when he first began. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.